making candy apples. I thought you didn't eat sugar. I don't. My sister's girls club is having a bazaar, and she asked me to make them. Uh. So what's that? Split pea soup. My mom made it for me this morning. And it's still hot? Yeah. See, the vacuum in here acts as insulation, just like your pot holder. Can I help you? Oh, no, I've got it under control. But it'll take a while for it to reach the right temperature. Well, I want to make something, too. Like what? Like ice cream. Ice cream? But Mark, it's below freezing outside. Oh, well then I won't eat it outside. Three, two, one. Contact is the secret, is the moment. When everything happens, contact is the answer, is the reason. Why everything happens, contact. Let's make Sandy, we left your bowl out in the cold all night long. Golly, things sure look a whole lot different when they get real hot or real cold. Hey, what are you doing now, Trine? I'm testing the candy syrup in cold water. See, when the temperature reaches about 300 degrees Fahrenheit, a drop of it will get hard in cold water. But it's still soft, so it's not ready yet. See? Yeah, but I bet it still tastes good. Hey, <laughs> mm. mm. yeah. Hi, Liz. Hi, Lisa. Hi, guys. How's your cold, Trini? Well, no sign of it today. I'm hoping my sneezing yesterday was a false alarm. Yeah, I hope you're right. But if you put the kettle on, I'll make some tea. Oh, sure. Hey, what's that you got over there? Hot soup? Wait till you see. Well, what is it? It's liquid nitrogen. Wait till you see what it does. <coughs> what is that, Lisa? Watch. Mark, do you have a racquetball I can use? Yeah, I think it's down here. There you go. You see, air is mostly oxygen and nitrogen. This nitrogen is the same as in the air, except for that it's been made so cold that it's actually a liquid. Well, it kind of looks like water to me. Don't touch it. It's so cold that you have to use these special gloves. Ah, oh, come on. Otherwise, your fingers will freeze and break like glass. Really? Come on, I don't believe you. Watch. I'll just take this out. I'll show you. Wow, that's fantastic. Wow. Mine is 320 degrees Fahrenheit. It is just like glass. As things get colder, their properties change. The ball was soft at room temperature and fragile at very cold temperatures. Glass is soft at very high temperatures and fragile at room temperature. started to cool off and become hard. Hard? It was falling off before. Well, now you can see that it's quite hard. In fact, <laughs> if I hit it hard enough, it breaks. That's one of the properties of glass. When it gets cold, it's very hard. But when it's hot, not only does it look like honey, oh, wow. but it drips. That's really neat. Just like pouring honey. Yeah, it does look like honey. Now you can see this glass, when I hit it with the hammer, nothing happens, because this glass is about 2,000 degrees. And then when it gets cool, it becomes hard. That's right. This glass over here has already become very hard and easily broken. So if I were to take some glass in my house and, and chop it up like that, would I be able to put it in the oven? Well, your oven only goes to 500 degrees, so that the glass wouldn't melt. That's right. What is you can see, the, the hot glass is like this honey. If you blow through the straw, you can see the bubbles. Just, just blow very, very gently. You can see that the bubbles form in the honey the same way that bubbles form in hot glass. What is glass made of, anyhow? I mean, like, I use it every day, but I've never really thought of what, what goes into it. Well, the principal ingredient of glass is powdered sand, which is used commercially for making glass. Here's some beach sand. This was used over 4,000 years ago by the Syrians and the Egyptians. But we buy broken glass from a factory that produces glass from these chemicals. And their rejects, we throw into the furnace and melt down. So you get all their mistakes? That's right. We take this glass and just throw it into the furnace, and it remelts. 
First thing we have to do is make sure that the furnace is up to temperature, 2,200 degrees. Okay, I have a stainless steel tube. It's quite cool at this end, but the end has been heated up red hot. Yeah. I'm reaching into the furnace, which is full of molten glass. That means it's all um, melted? Right, the glass is in a liquid state. And you can see how the glass is flowing very slowly back and forth. Okay, now I'm going to roll this on the table. This is, this is the marvering table. Why are you rolling it? I'm rolling it to make the outside of the gather symmetrical. Now I'm going to blow through the tube to make a bubble at the end of the pipe. When you blow a bubble, how come it always comes out round? Because there's an equal pressure exerted on all sides of the interior of the bubble. So that forms a sphere in your body. You couldn't get a square bubble? What if you had a square straw? No, it would still make a round bubble. Now, this bubble has cooled down considerably, so I have to go back to the furnace and reheat it. Now, what do you have to do after this? All we have to do is make a, uh, a mark on the glass to break this bubble away from the steel pipe. You ready? Uh-huh. Okay, now you can see that fairly hot now, and if we stop turning it, Whoa. the glass starts to fall down and droop. See What's pulling it down like that? The force of gravity is, is pulling against the glass. So if you keep it rolling evenly, the glass will stay symmetrical. Okay, now you just have to squeeze a groove between the bubble and the, and the pipe. You know, the heat is really <laughs> coming up from this glass. Hot! Woo! Well, it, it's only about 1,800 degrees now. Is that all? <laughs> no, it, it's cooled off considerably. I'm just using a solid rod this time. And again, I'm reaching into the furnace, gathering some glass on the end of it. I have to go to the marbling table. Yeah, this is going to be the stem on the bottom of the goblet. OK. Keep rolling? Yeah, keep rolling. OK. OK, now stop rolling for a second. I'll roll it again. Now this just sticks on to each other? That's right. The glass sticks because it's so hot. Even though this doesn't appear hot anymore, it's still about 1,200 degrees. I can just squeeze this glass with the shears and cut it right off. It's almost like clay the way it cuts. Just... Okay. I'm just checking the stem now to make sure that it's on center. I'm squeezing jacks make little marks. Now this is going to be the decoration for the stem. So you can you can decorate it while it's still hot, huh? That's right. Now the next thing I'll do is gather some glass on the bottom of the stem. I'll flatten that glass out and squeeze it so it makes a foot so the goblet has something to stand on. That just evens it out. Right. I finished squeezing it between the two pieces of wood. You really make it look so easy. I can't believe it. It is easy. I'm sure after about 12 lessons, you can make something that looks like this. Maybe not exactly like this. <laughs> now, I'm just taking a small gather of glass. Now, I attach this rod to the bottom of the goblet. Mm -hmm. Let it roll. Make sure it's on the center. Now, I just scratch the neck. And tap it. You see that it breaks off from the pipe and leaves a very jagged mark. I just have to heat up the top part of the bubble and then you can help me open that bubble up so that we can drink out of it. Now you use those stainless steel tools again called the jacks. Just put the fingers inside the hole and push up against the top edge of the bubble to open it up. Spread out? Just a little bit. That's it, right there. Good. Very good. That's really neat. Okay, there we go. Is this it? I mean, is That's it a glass it. now? Yeah, here we are. Finished goblet. Wow. Okay, you want to hold that up there? It's so beautiful. 
I can't believe we made it just like that all of a sudden. It's really nice. I can't believe that. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. It was so pretty after all that work. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, so am I. <laughs> well, well, at least we could just pick it up and put it back in the fire and start all over again. Yeah, that's one thing we've learned today. Right? Always melt the glass back down. Glass is very easily recyclable. That's good. What's this all for? Wouldn't the ice cream freeze if it were just surrounded by ice? Well, not according to this recipe. Ice isn't cold enough to make ice cream. The right temperature for making ice cream is 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, go on. A well, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I were to only use ice, I wouldn't be able to get the temperature any lower than 32 degrees. But you said you have to get it down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Is that what the salt's for? Right. You add salt, and it lowers the freezing point of the mixture, so it's cold enough to make the ice cream. All right, I'm there. You're where? At the hard crack stage. Mmm. Mmm. Tea's way. You go ahead and have yours. I'm still busy with the apples. And you didn't understand what I meant before. See, I took sugar, which is a solid, and I turned it into a very thick syrup. Temperature change did that, right? Uh-huh. Bet you can't stir your tea with this spoon. Why not? Go ahead, try it. Okay, Mark. A metal spoon melted in tea? The spoon was made of wood's metal, which melts at 168 degrees Fahrenheit, so the tea was hot enough. Even rocks will melt if they're hot enough. Deep inside the earth, it's so hot that rock melts. In some places, that melted rock erupts onto the surface to make volcanoes. Rick Hazlitt is the scientist who showed me this volcano in Hawaii. Is this the volcano? Yeah, we're on the volcano now. It doesn't look like one. Well, no, it doesn't. But uh, this volcano is very, very large. That's a, uh, a hard surface of lava on the bottom. It's still very hot in cracks. But, uh, you know, if you could go down there by helicopter, it's about 350 feet down. You could walk on that surface quite easily. Uh, as I say, it's only hot in cracks. But the rest of it isn't so hot? The rest of it isn't so hot. You know, it's like walking on a parking lot back home. Oh, yeah? Is, is, is it hard? I thought it would be soft. No, it's cooled now. Uh, and there's a solid, hard crust uh, on the floor of the crater. Now, there's still pockets of very hot rock down there. You can see the sulfur and the uh, steam cracks on the bottom. That's there are those uh, lines down there. Yeah. yeah. How come parts of it haven't cooled yet? because there are large fractures underneath the crater floor that still contain this hot lava rock. How hot is it? About 2,000 degrees when it first comes out of the ground. And, uh, boy, that's hotter than, than uh, melted steel or hotter than melted copper. Well, the lava began to form about 40 miles down, and then through a period of many years, it came up to the surface and uh, erupted here in 1971. What's that steam from? That steam is from one of these cracks. When the cracks opened up, they opened up almost all the way down to the hot magma. So anytime it rains now, the water seeps down to hot rock and it comes steaming back out of the ground. Can you ever like look over the end of one of these faults and see red lava magma? Not here. Not right now, but uh, there are places in this national park where uh, the ground actually glows after dark, hmm. where it's over a thousand degrees, only a foot or two down. But does that make the surface any warmer? Yes, it makes it quite warm. In fact, uh, if I were to uh, put my backpack or some of this equipment down on that hot ground, it might melt in part. Really? It's very uncomfortable to stand on it so hot. <laughs> Now, how come this lava is different from that lava? Oh, okay. Well, uh, see how this lava seems to have uh, flowed in uh, kind of pasty tubes? Yeah. It was very hot and very fluid, just like toothpaste or syrup. And it erupted from a vent seven miles away. And as the lava came down the mountainside, it tended to form these little tubes that would break open and make more tubes. Well, how about this other stuff? Okay, this is uh, a very chunky type of lava that's 
much cooler. How come that got cooler? Well, because it traveled uh, further from the vent and it lost some gas. Okay. The air temperature so cooled then it down. the vent that this came from is further away than the vent that this came from? Yes, it traveled farther on the surface. Yeah. So then isn't it dangerous to live near a volcano? Not dangerous to live around this volcano, as long as the Volcano Observatory can predict the eruptions and tell us when to move away. You see, once you get some experience watching eruptions, you know what is dangerous and what isn't. And they're really quite safe to observe. Minus 15 degrees Celsius. Zero degrees. 10. 20, 30, 40, it's hot. It's hot. It's hot. 70, 100, 200, 1600, 5,000 degrees Celsius. Stand like you saw Kilauea. It's beautiful. Hey, Mark and Trini, this is Marilyn C. Oh, Volcanoes are my hobby. Oh, Volcanoes. Yeah. So what do you do with them? I chase them. You chase <laughs> them? Why? Well, you know, that's a provocative question because my background in science is just like the ordinary high school college student. But I love nature and I love learning. And I love volcanoes because they're part of nature. When you look into the crater of the volcano and you, you know that 1,800 miles down deep in the valley of the earth, there's a bubbling, boiling lake of molten rock. It just spins your mind. Isn't it frightening to look down yeah. there? Yeah. It is, but even more frightening to be caught in front of a flow of lava, which can be clocked at 25 miles an hour. And if you think that that's easy, try running beside your father's car, which is running at 25 miles an hour. Marilyn, yeah. what, what makes a, vol a volcano blow up? Well, down below the surface of the Earth, there are hot spots where the molten rock collects and intersperses among the rocks. And you see, when the pressures get high enough and the temperature gets high enough, it makes its way through those rocks and disperses the rocks underneath. It makes them shift so that an earthquake, or at least tremors occur, sometimes a bone during an earthquake will occur. And it will immediately be followed by the rise of that molten lava and pretty soon you see it shooting up into the air. How did you first get started? I mean, which, what was your first volcano? <laughs> Irasu in Costa Rica was the first one. In fact, it was a very famous volcano because when the molten rock shot up from the volcano, it got into the atmosphere and congealed in the form of five-ton boulders. Now, when you think of that, wow. that that's roughly speaking the tonnage of a car. That's a lot. Could you think of having a car fall on top of you? No, no thanks. thanks. <laughs> okay. When those boulders came down from the atmosphere, they destroyed everything. Barns, houses, cattle, people. What happens to the lava after it flows out from the volcano? Well, some of it will go into the sea, as in the case of Kilauea. And right. Stuff. And it comes down at about 2,000 degrees, and when it hits the sea, it flashes to steam. And of course, the water fragments the lava, and it forms instant beaches. If someday scientists do get to predict when a volcano is going to erupt, do you think that'll be helpful in terms of having people feel freer to live near a volcano, say? Well, it depends on that. I think if I were a person living near a volcano, and e even though they predicted it and I knew I had time to get out, I don't know that I would want, take a, want to take a chance of my home being destroyed. No, I don't know if I would either. <laughs> you know, it's like living nice in a visit. flood area. We right. want to live there. It's like living in a flood area. Once you have your home destroyed by a flood, you really think twice before you rebuild. How close are they to being able to predict when a volcano is going to erupt? Well, sometimes you get clues and can foresee when the eruption will take place. We get surprises once in a while. Predicting volcanoes is still something of a mystery. Well, we all enjoy a good mystery. Whenever there's trouble, we're there on the double with the Bloodhound Gang. If you've got the crime, we've got the time with the Bloodhound Gang. What are you studying now? To be a square knot? 
A lotus flower. Fair. Looks more like a geranium to me. Mr. Bloodhound left his raincoat again. Oh, that's okay. It's not raining. Now, that's better. Remember, we have that new disco to go to tonight. I'll get it. But only if you'll watch my new magic trick. I'll watch. I'll watch. Bloodhound Detective Agency, whenever there's trouble, we're there on the double. Mr. Bloodhound isn't here. Yeah? Madame Jubari? Hercules? Oh, the circus! Got it. We'll be right there. Take the scissors. What's up? Now, cut the rope. Right in the middle, Vicky. Who called? Snip, snip, snip. Come on. What was that message, Ricardo? Oh, something about a flea napping. What's a flea napping? Now, watch me put the rope back together again. Flea napping? Circus. The flea circus? Yeah, Professor Baldini said someone stole his trained flea. Is this the address? Yeah. Well, let's go. I said I'd watch your trick, but I didn't say when. The grand opening is closed, my sparrows. Bloodhound Detective Agency. Oh, who'd want to steal fleas? Fleas? World famous artiste. <laughs> Dear Madame Dubarry, Queen of Ballerina, my dashing chariot racers, and Hercules, the strongest flea in the world. My family, my loved ones. Do you have any idea who might have burgled your artiste? Of course. That art scoundrel Pugs. Who's he? Oh, an imposter of pulicology. Of what? A professor of fleas, but the man's a fraud. He couldn't train a flea to... to bite. Tell us what happened exactly. I wasn't here, but my new assistant sleeps in the back. Uh, Hank! <laughs> Tell them. Well, uh, it had it happened in the night. Okay. Stolen last night. Yep. I set my alarm for 9 o'clock this morning. Didn't want to oversleep on the big day. Was tuckered out, so went to bed early. 8 o'clock. Got a good 13 hours sleep. Okay, so Professor Pugs broke in sometime between 8 last night and 9 this morning. Quiet as a mouse, too. I'm a light sleeper. Can you give me a description of Professor Pugs? I never laid eyes on him. I don't bother myself with his kind of circus riffraff. An Englishman, I'm told. And wears a monocle in his eye like some blooming English gentleman. Vicky, this guy doesn't look Jimmy. Fresh paint. Not a mark on it. Pugs had himself a key. Must have found it in the dustbin. What's a dustbin? That's what they call a trash can. Where? In England. Dustbin. And that door wasn't chimmied. Something wrong about the way Hank set his clock. Ah, uh, I have it. Professor Baldini, get ready for your grand opening. I believe the fleas are still on the premises. One of the clues is in Mr. Hank's clock. The mystery is solved. Careful where you step. The fleas may be on the floor. I didn't say they got loose. No one broke in here last night. And who stole the professor's fleas? You did. Horse feathers. Didn't you say you set your alarm for nine this morning and went to bed at eight last night? That's right. And you didn't hear a sound? Not until the alarm went off at nine this morning. Impossible. If you set your alarm for nine and went to bed at eight, it started ringing in one hour. Your alibi is a fake. Hank. I think his name is Professor Pugs. What? In my own employee? He said dustbin for trash can. That's English English, isn't it? And I think his accent is phony, too. What have you done with my circus troop, you unspeakable rascal? What indeed? Goodbye and farewell, you old fool. The suitcase! You both trick. Little boy, come here. An artiste! Stop him! Oh, my flea 
hotel. <laughs> ah, there you are, Madame Dubarry. Oh, how exquisite you look. Ah, my charioteers, hello. And Hercules, what a handsome devil. <laughs> Almost showtime, my pets. We warmed up the ice, it melted, and now it's water again. Let's not leave your bowl outside anymore, okay? Today we've seen how different things change when they're heated to very high temperatures. Wow, that's really fascinating, Marilyn. I never knew that. I've got to go. I hear there are rumblings in Costa Rica. Oh, hey, why don't you take a candy apple with you? Great. A person can't live by love all alone. Take care, bye -bye. Marilyn. We'll do. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah, she was at Kilauea, the same place as me. Travel into the dangerous world of the Alaskan bush where modern-day pioneer families choose to challenge the hardships of America's last frontier. See Braving Alaska on the next National Geographic special, tonight at 8, here on OPB. from the Children's Television Workshop. And you can see it here, five days a week, on... Three, two, one! Contact! Three, two, one, Contact is a production of the Children's Television Workshop.